Well, good morning. Good morning. How are you? It's good to see you today. Missed you last week, but uh, as you heard, the circumstances were a little different. I uh, did, uh, to, to be uh, thankful, I did have finally a procedure that worked, and I got some relief, but uh, I had a reaction. So I wound up in the ER last Sunday morning. Um, at about 4.30, we were running to Charleston. So it's good to be here today. I am feeling a little bit better. Uh, pray for me Friday. I had the same procedure again at 12.30. Uh, so hopefully we've done some things proactively. I won't have the same response. But keep me in your prayers this Friday about 12.30. And I start therapy tomorrow. So we're thankfully to a place that I can do that. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to that and feeling a lot better. So appreciate your prayers so far. Uh, definitely felt them and I thank you for them. I uh, missed last week. You got a great illustration for last week's message. Uh, be careful what you plan, right? You say you're going to do this and that tomorrow, and boy, the things can change really quickly. Uh, I got that myself. Andrew got that when he got the call at about 5 o'clock in the morning, Sunday morning, say, hey, it's yours. Uh, so I'm really thankful that we do have a staff that can pick up the pieces and run with them. Uh, I know you had a great sermon last week. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing this one. This is one of those that you go, eh, not money again in church. Yeah, money again in church. We're going to talk about that this morning. Uh, James was very specific about it. It's actually a very negative message today. Uh, and I got something to lead off with it. I, I did some research as I was preparing. How many of you uh, have heard the name Charles Schwab? Anybody? Okay, what comes to mind? Money, retirement, investments. Uh, that's many of you maybe even have uh, your future vested in Charles Schwab. Well, there was another Charles Schwab before the Charles Schwab that I want to talk about. He lived in the early 21st century. He was uh, a very intelligent man, a great businessman. He was actually the president of Bethlehem Steel, one of the second largest steel companies in the world at the time. Uh, he, he really dramatically changed the industry to a point that he had a monopoly in the steel industry during World War I. So needless to say, it made him a lot of money. All right? He was a millionaire. Uh, early, and of course, in the early 20th century, a million of dollars was a lot of money. So he was a millionaire, and he lived a luxurious lifestyle. He used his money to buy a lot of houses. One of his houses in the uh, late 19-teens went for like $7 million. Again, that was a lot of money back then. Uh, so he had a lot of houses. He had a lot of luxurious things. He spent his money uh, on some neat things. I didn't know this. Um, right before the Great Depression, he bought a soccer team. This uh, Charles Schwab owned a soccer team called the Bethlehem Steel Football Club, and he got them to go professional, I think it was 1914, and let me see, they won so many titles, it was the best soccer team ever in the United States, I'd never heard of them, they won eight league cha championships, six American Cups, five National Challenge Cups, again, one of the greatest soccer teams in U.S. history this man bought, so this guy was living the dream. He had all the money, he had all the houses, he even had his own professional sports team. So he had had everything that you and I would think of. Unfortunately, there was much more to him than that, uh, and not all of it was positive. He was very manipulative, he abused his wealth and his position to get what he wanted. He was known as the master hustler of his day. That was the term they used for him. He had notoriety for his spending habits, for his marital affairs, or extramarital affairs, and for his gambling. Uh, before the Great Depression actually started, he lost about $40 million of his wealth. And by the end of the Great Depression, he was worth about $300,000 to the negative. So this man, who in the early 20s uh, was worth $200 million, by the time of the end of the Great Depression was in the hole $300,000, living alone in an apartment, borrowing money from his friends. And I thought about that. I thought, wow, that's a great illustration of what we're going to talk about today. And here's, here's, here's a warning that's going to come from that illustration. It says, beware. Your title today is beware. Guard against every kind of greed. Guard against every kind of greed. That's the sermon summary today. It, and it's pretty simple. I hope you will join me in, uh, in saying that we need to get this today because greed is a big problem. All right. I ask you to turn in your Bibles with me. We're going to go to James chapter 5, just six verses, one through six. If you don't have a Bible underneath your seats or New Living Translations, which is what's in my iPad, uh, it's on page 737. So why don't you get your Bibles and stand up with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. Again, a very short passage, but a very pointed passage. The Bible's underneath you, 737, if you want to use those. Otherwise, you can just listen to me read, okay? Everybody ready? He says, look here, or listen up, you rich people. Weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away. 
and your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and silver have become worthless. The very wealth you were counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This treasure you have accumulated will stand as evidence against you on the day of judgment. For listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. The wages you held back cry out against you. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of Heaven's armies. You have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed innocent people who do not resist you. Let's pray. God, we we want you to prepare our hearts. Um, We really are wealthy people, much wealthier than we will accept, and hopefully we'll understand that today. And this warning is for all of us here this morning. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you give us, but we ask your forgiveness for the abuse that we we are guilty of, all of us. God, please prepare our hearts. Let us put away the things of the world so that we can focus on how to overcome this demon of greed. Those who aren't included in us, those who aren't Christians, God, they picked a great time to be here uh, because they understand heaven and hell. But today they're going to understand how we're supposed to live between now and then. And maybe this will be what's intriguing enough for them to ask Jesus to come into their hearts who will change them. God, we pray that that will be the end result. We love you and thank you. Remove me from your word. Speak through it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat, please. All right. Don't you just hate it when you show up for church and the pastor talks about money. All right, money, money, money. Why do we talk about it so much? Well, just about every author of the Bible wrote about money. Jesus spoke about it a lot. And so this, this really is a very important subject that we have to talk about. It's kind of nice that we do expositional studies because we're going to hit every important topic at the right time. So we must need to talk about money today, all right? Because that's where we are in the text. Now, if you have been with us, you understand the setting. We had the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem who got scattered. Saul, who would later become Paul, had run them out. They were being thrown into jail. They were being beaten and killed. And so they scattered throughout the Roman Empire of the day. And then we talked about the Roman Empire. It wasn't like America. America is quite different than most other economies. Our biggest number of people are in the middle class. Most Americans are middle class people. We have some people in the upper class, some people in the lower class, but we're mostly a middle class nation. Back then in a nation like that, there was no middle class. There was the wealthy, the top 10%, and they were really, really rich. And then there was the poor, which made up 90% of the country, 90% of the area. And poor meant something more back then than it means to us. We think we're poor when we miss out on a few things. Back then, poor meant that you were homeless, helpless, and destitute. In other words, biblically poor meant you didn't have a regular place to lay your head, you didn't know if you were going to get your next meal, and you had just the clothes on your back. That's what it meant to be poor. And so 90% of this church that he's writing to, that's their living conditions. They're very, very poor. And obviously there's some rich people who have gotten saved and come into the church because he's addressed them twice so far or talked about them. Now he's going to address them. He's going to speak specifically to them. And he says, listen up. All right, listen up. There's terrible troubles ahead. Okay, terrible troubles ahead. Let me get this out of the way. Money is not bad. All right, there's nothing bad about money. All right, money's not bad. God doesn't hate money. And people with money aren't necessarily bad. God doesn't hate people with money. We don't have a poverty gospel that only the poor people are are good with God. God doesn't hate money. He doesn't hate people who have money. But he hates what money can do. He hates the sin that comes from the desire for money. And that's where this comes out. That's what James is talking about. That's why he says, listen up. Okay, Listen up. There's terrible trouble ahead because of what money can do. And then he shares with them what the trouble is. He says, your wealth is temporary. The trouble ahead is that your wealth is temporary. It's all going to fade. He speaks of basically three different categories, and this is not explicitly there. Uh, You have to read into the text that maybe he's talking about fine foods. When he talks about riches, um, it's a general term, but when he talks about rotting, and you look in the extra biblical text, the other other word, excuse me, books written in the first century, this Greek word meant Uh, rotting wood or rotting flesh or rotting food and so it appears that he's talking about maybe fine food here that's rotting these wealthy people would spend their money on the most expensive things of the day all right the most expensive foods and he's saying you know what all that's just going to rot then the fine clothes that's obviously there the term that he used means a cloak or a robe 
Back in those days, the really rich people would have these outer garments that they would sew, maybe embellishments in gold, gems, whatever. They would have these very expensive cloaks that they would drape over themselves so that when they walked through the streets, uh, people would know that they were in the top 10%. Here is everybody else in rags, and you got this person walking through the streets with maybe gems and gold on their coats. Okay, that's a, that's a rich person. And he says, guess what? That's going to rot. Okay, Your clothes, they're all going to rot. The moths are going to eat them. Uh, and then he talks about precious metals. Precious metals, as is, is, uh, you read in the Bible, a lot of worship of God requires precious metals. When you look back at the temple and the tabernacle, they had to make things out of gold. They used certain gems and stones. They used silver. So the gold and the silver itself is it, not necessarily bad. It's how people were using it. And, and in these days, that first century, the rich people would, would not just wear a ring on a finger. They would have multiple rings on a finger, maybe multiple rings on every finger. And they, they might would wear large necklaces with big gold pieces wrapped around their necks. They would use precious gold or silver to show the world that they were very wealthy. Okay? They stood out. And what he's saying is here, guess what? You're, that's going to corrode as well. And some believe that it's just the refinement process back then wasn't as good as it is today, and they would have some alloys that would cause it to rust. So what he's saying is, look, find food, find clothes, find precious metals. It's all temporary. It's all going to rot. It's all going to corrode. It's all going to go away. Um, I wrote this, this message sitting in my, my uh, recliner at the house. Um, I've been spending a lot of time there lately. And uh, when I was reading this, this really struck me to take a virtual tour of my own house. And I want you to do that. I want you to follow me on this. Uh, take a virtual tour of your house. Let's, let's go to the kitchen, okay? In your mind, let's go to the kitchen, the cupboards. Let's look in the cupboards. Let's look up and down. Let's look in the refrigerator. Let's look in the freezer. Um, how much food do you have in your house? Okay, what kind of food do you have in your house? We spend $1,000 a month on food. How much do you spend a month on food? You think about it. There's six of us, $1,000. We've got cupboards. We've got the extra refrigerator in the garage. We've got an extra freezer in the garage. Just to have all the food that we need. But do we really need that much? Every meal, we throw away food. How about you? Are your plates always empty at the end of the meal? Every meal, we throw away food. And yet we don't think we have much. You know what? If we were poor, we wouldn't need a garbage disposal. We would never throw away food if we were poor. So we're very, very wealthy, aren't we? When I walk through my kitchen, I see we have so much food. We wind up, what do you do? Oh, I'm not going to throw it away. I'll save it. Somewhere. So we'll eat it later. And we fill the refrigerator up with little containers. And what do we do a week later? I can't get the new stuff in, so i got to go throw away the old stuff. And you get a whole garbage bag more of food going back out. You know, if, if you were poor... You wouldn't need an extra refrigerator, would you? Or an extra freezer? You and I, we throw away so much food. And it's truly, truly sad, isn't it? It just rots. Let's walk back to your bedroom. All right? I'm going to go back to your bedroom now. Pastor's coming. What's in your bedroom? Right. Let's just stop right there. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to go to your closet. And I'm going to open your closet. It was funny as I was writing this. I was sitting in my chair with my computer in my lap, and I had at home HGTV on. Any of you watch HGTV? It's like, it's like the white noise in my house. And, and the term came up exactly at this time, walk-in closet. Right? If you're going to sell a house, it better have a walk-in closet. If you're going to redo a house, it better put a walk-in closet. You know, most of these new houses need, need closets that are bigger than my bedroom when I was growing up. Probably bigger than my bedroom now. Uh, but you better have a walk-in closet, right? So open that walk-in closet. What do you have in that closet? How many days could you go without wearing the same thing twice? How many days could you go without wearing the same shoes twice? Okay? If you were poor, you wouldn't need a walk-in closet. Right? You wouldn't need those extra boxes that are out in the garage because you change your seasonal clothes out. You would only have enough. You wouldn't need that if you were poor. Now let's walk over to your dresser. Let's open your jewelry box. You got a jewelry box on your dresser? Okay, let's open your jewelry box. How many necklaces will I find? How many rings are in there? How many sets of earrings? Let's open the second jewelry box because the first one wasn't big enough. And let's go through the, the trinkets and beads that you have there. If you were poor, you wouldn't need a jewelry box. All right? Now, this virtual tour is for a purpose. It's not to crush your spirit. It's to make you realize you're wealthy. Okay? 90% of the people in this room would be considered rich according to the standards that we're talking about. 
We hear a message like this and we say, that doesn't apply to me. He's talking to the rich. He's talking to the 10%. He's talking to the 10% in the Roman Empire. He's talking to the 90% in America. We are rich. We're very, very wealthy. And so don't tune this message out. There may be great trouble ahead for us. And we may just miss it. So we're all wealthy. We just established that, right? We just took a virtual tour of your home. So be very, very careful. Everything that you just saw when you took that tour is going to fade away. Everything you just touched is going to go away. It's going to corrode. It's going to rot. It's not going to be taken with you. None of it's eternal. Keep that in mind. All right? It's all temporary. The next thing he says, and we've got to be careful of this, is wealth is tempting. Those things we just saw, they're tempting. All of them are tempting. Okay? Um, James uses another visual illustration here that, that really is powerful. He warns that wealth will eat away at your flesh like fire. In other words, the desire for money, the desire for things, will eat away and consume you. That's what he's saying. You've got to be really, really careful of the temptation of worldly pleasures because they'll consume you. The first thing he says it does, this temptation, tempts you to hoard. You become a hoarder, okay? Hoarding. One is nice. I really, really want this. And we get this in our mind. Lee and I have talked about this a lot. This has happened to us. We thought there's this one thing that's going to make us happy. If we just get this one thing, I'll never need anything else again. I'll never ask for anything else again. If I can just have that one thing. And what happens when you get it? <laughs> right? Just like, poof, it's gone. I got it. Now I need this one thing. I just need this one thing and I'll be happy. You get that? Okay, I just need... Will you ever satisfy the demon of greed? Is it possible to feed it enough for it to stop? It's not. As we gather things and collect things and... Don't raise your hand. How many of you have storage buildings because your house isn't big enough? Hmm. We hoard things. We collect things. There's a temptation. I need more. I've got to have more. I can't use it. I can't do anything with it. But I need it. I need more. Okay? Hoarding. Hoarding is a big temptation. The other temptation is cheating. He talks about this very specifically. He talks about cheating the laborers out of their pay. You see, back then, the top 10%... They owned all the land, and in order to make money off their land, they had to produce something, whether it was figs or grapes or whatever. And so he would get the poor people, right, to come and work in the fields. Well, they're poor. They have nothing, so they'll work for a dollar. They'll work for two dollars. When you have nothing, a dollar is something. And so they would rip them off. They would rob them, but they wouldn't pay them a working wage. Why should they? I, I want more. I want more of what, I've, what I have, so I'm going to leverage what I have and I'm going to make as much as I can and I don't care how it affects you. All right? Keep that in mind. I just want more. I don't care how it affects you. That's cheating others out of wealth, okay? So they were cheating people. So let's do the mirror test again. I've already convinced you that you're rich. Now, let's see if you've given in to temptation. Whew, what's in that closet? What's in your closet? As I shared, how many days could you go without wearing the same thing twice? How many shirts do you have? How many suits do you have? How many skirts and dresses do you have? How many pairs of shoes? Boy, you wouldn't want to see my closet. You can't even see the floor. I'm, I'm a shoe nut, okay? I'm a shoe nut. I have so many pairs of shoes. Can I wear them all at the same time? There's shoes in there I probably haven't worn in a year. All right, but will I get rid of them? No way. They're mine. Mine, mine, all mine. You know, that's what boarding says. They're all mine. I might wear them someday. How about those clothes? I put on about 15 pounds. I probably can't wear some of those clothes, but I'll wear them one day, right? I'll lose the weight. I'll put them on again. Some of you shake your heads. You know how this is. Look in your closet. Are you hoarding? Are you guilty of hoarding? Um, look in your garage. This is a good one. This is a really good one. Um, our house has a luxury. What was a luxury back in the 70s? That's a one-car garage, right? Now, I don't... It's a lie to call it a garage, because I've owned cars from back in the 70s, and they wouldn't fit in this garage. My Ford Focus won't fit in this garage. So to call it a garage is a lie. Right? It's just a selling point for the house. About the 80s, 90s, the luxury was two-car garage, right? Some of you my age. It was a luxury to buy a house with two-car garage. What's the luxury now? Three. Right? Mostly two adults live in the house, but we've got to have a three-car garage. Am I hoarding? I mean, just think about it. You may need it, but then again, do you? Okay? Think about it. Um, are you hoarding? Are you collecting things? Again, look in that jewelry box. How much do you have? Are you hoarding? Are you hoarding? Um, 
how about the cheating? The cheating was a little more difficult. Some of you may be business owners, and I hope if you are, you're paying living wages because you know understand how God feels about that. Um, if you're cheating the people that are working for you, you saw it very clearly, there's great trouble ahead. But this is the environment that I thought about because I don't have that kind of business. Um, I thought about when I eat out. You know eating out is a luxury, right? Eating out is a big luxury. It's a big business in the United States right now. But eating out is a luxury. It's a luxury because I don't have to shop for the food. I don't have to prepare the food. I don't have to deliver the food. I don't have to go get all the extras that were forgotten when I delivered it. And I don't have to refill the glasses. And I don't have to clean up after myself. So it's a luxury. All right? It's a luxury. Okay? But what about that person who's doing all that? You know, I think it's ludicrous that companies can pay waiters and waitresses less than minimum wage. I think it should be illegal. This is not right. They're cheating people. Businesses are cheating people. And when we sit there, we have the benefit of making up for that. We have the ability to make a difference for them. And yet, you know what? What drove me to this is something that I heard said years ago of a couple of different waiters and waitresses at the same time. You know when they hate to work? Sunday. Why do they hate to work on Sundays? Because church people are the worst tippers. They'll tell you that. Most, most people who wait tables don't want to work Sunday because Christians are the worst tippers. Isn't that sad? That's truly sad. We're going to finish up here and explain how we are to redeem wealth. We shouldn't be cheating people who are giving us luxuries. right? We should be very, very generous instead. But yet we do cheat. So that's just one example. That, take a picture. Look at yourself. Are you guilty of these things? Have you given in to the temptation of wealth? All right. If you have, we'll see some, some different things because wealth can be telling. All right. Wealth can be telling. This is what James says. We wrap this up in verses 5 and 6. He now explains where giving in to temptation will take you. The first place it will take you to a selfish lifestyle. All right. You will start to have a selfish lifestyle. The word luxury itself is very important. I've used it several times on purpose. What does luxury actually mean? It means adding to pleasure or comfort, but not absolutely necessary. So it's something you don't really have to have. You just add it for comfort okay, or pleasure. It's a luxury. All right? Living in luxury can be a sign that someone is fattened up for the judgment, as he uses okay, Fattened up for the slaughter. It's an indication, can be an indication, that a person is starting to look inward. Okay? Living in luxury means I want pleasure and I don't care how it affects you. Right? I don't see how it affects you. Okay? I want to live in luxury. It's a selfish lifestyle, the life of luxury. The other thing that he talks about is abuse of, of advantage. Wealth gives a person advantage. There's no question. Right? Wealth gives a person advantage. And when he speaks of killing or murdering others, many believe it's a judicial picture where the rich people basically own the courts. If a rich person took you to, to court, they could take everything you had. They could take your ability to make a living. They could basically kill you in court. What James is saying, he spoke of this earlier in, his, in this book, he's speaking of, of the rich people taking advantage of the fact that they have wealth or using it to leverage. Okay? And we see that when we've given in. It's a telling sign when we abuse the wealth that we have for advantage. So these things are truly happening today. There's no question. Luxury is a motivator. All right, it's a motivator in just about every industry that we have. Uh, the desire for luxury drives us to make purchases and, and do the things that we do. And unfortunately, it is sad because we may just be fattening ourselves up for the slaughter. Right? Because we don't seem to care how it affects those who don't have anything. We just want to have everything. So as Paul, Paul told Timothy, he says, you know what? And I believe James is trying to say the same thing. The love of money, not the money, is the root of all evil. Some people craving money or luxury or all these things have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So what is he saying? He's saying beware. It's, it's a one-word sermon. Beware. Beware. Greed can consume you. Greed can fatten you up for the slaughter. Now, this is one of those times that I got to talk to Andrew about it. I said, you know, James really came down negative and never gave a solution. Usually he says, here's the problem, here's why it happened, here's what you do. In this case, man, he's just really pointed. He's just really saying negative stuff about what wealth can do and what wealth can do. It's dangerous, there's great trouble ahead. And he doesn't really, in this portion, give the solution. It's found throughout the book, of course, but he doesn't give this solution. So I want to do something. I want to end on a positive. I want to talk about redeeming wealth, okay? I want to talk about redeeming, because money's not bad. Money in itself isn't bad, and having money isn't a bad thing. 
Um, let's talk about redeeming wealth. Okay? The Bible doesn't say that you've got to be poor to be right with God. Understand that. All right? The Bible tells us that the love of money is dangerous. So how do we break the love of money? First, give it. Give it. How do you defeat the demon of greed? You give it away. Okay, one of my favorite passages on, on giving is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, if you want it for your notes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul speaks of the fact that God always provides for us. He always gives us enough money to buy what we need. And thankfully, he always gives us a little more. He always gives us a little more. And is that extra for our luxury? Is that little more that he gives us intended for us to live at ease? No, according to that passage, the little more that he gives us is to share with those who do not have enough. Okay? That's God's economy. To some he gives a lot, to some he gives a little, and he expects us to do the right thing when we have a lot. So he expects us to give. Where do we start giving? It's the church. Okay? You can't have a message on money without talking about tithing. What do we do? We tithe. We tithe 10%. That's what the, the scriptures tell us. Tithe, by definition, is 10%. goes into the storehouse, the church, to pay for the ministries that support the community. Okay? How does this work? If you make $1,000 a week, what is your tithe? Speak back. Math class. $100. Okay? It's pretty easy. If you make $1,000 a week, that's a $52,000 salary a year, which is probably the average. Your tithe is $100 a week. It's simple. You give it. You break the greed monster. Many of us can't sometimes because, again, I understand it. It happens to me. All right, it has happened to me. I got a lot of medical bills, as you know. I mean, you got to pay for MRIs and CAT scans and all these other things, all these other procedures. Months come where you just got extra bills and you can't do it. God knows what you're going through. Okay, He knows what you're going through. When you can't give, He understands. But He does expect you to do things and put things in place so that you can if it ever happens again. Right? So he expects you to give. He gives you enough so that you can give. And so you start with the church with that 10%. Of course, the New Testament takes a little bit further. The New Testament doesn't say 10%. It says generously. And to some people, 10% is not generously. Okay? We are to give generously to the work of the Lord. So give it. It'll break the demon of greed. The second thing to do is to do good with it. All right? Do good with it. This is the reference from 1 Timothy chapter 6 I spoke of just a minute ago where Paul tells Timothy that it's the love of money, not money itself, that's the root of all evil. And he gets down to the end later in his discussion, and he tells the rich people, hey, listen, you're rich, do good with your money. Make sure you're doing good with it, the money that God's given you. What's that look like today? I just thought of a few things. If it breaks your heart to know that there are starving children on our planet, you can do good by contributing to the solution. If it breaks your heart... When you hear about people dying because they don't have clean drinking water, and that's true, right? You can do something good by adding to the solution. Here's one that's, I, I know it's a big deal in here. If your heart breaks over a specific disease that we haven't found a cure for, you can do good by helping to contribute to the cure. Uh, and here's one that you're really good about. If your heart breaks over the needs in the local community, you can give above and beyond your tithes to help meet those needs, Okay? What breaks your heart? I love to ask that question. What breaks your heart? What makes you cry? What if, it's different for all of us. Okay? What upsets you? What need in the world upsets you? Awesome. God put that on your heart for a reason. He gave you some money to contribute to it. Make a difference. Do good with it. And when you do, you will kill the demon of greed. Right? You'll kill the demon of greed. So, if you heard nothing else, hear this. Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Okay? Guard against every kind of greed. Because for the greedy person, there's great trouble ahead. Maybe it means that you're unsaved and you don't understand why God gives you resources. And of course, there's great trouble ahead at the final judgment when everything you own is taken from you and you're judged for your sins. Or maybe it is that you are a believer and unfortunately you've gotten away from the Lord and you've gotten caught up in the wealth. And as we know, all these things will be burned up and they'll just be like wood, hay, and stubble. And you'll be stay, saved just as a snatch from the fire, the scriptures say. So today's the day to make that difference. Today's the day to see on your virtual tour of your home, as you took a minute ago, are there things that need to be cleared out? Are there areas in your life that you're hoarding? Are there ways that you're leveraging what you have? Are there ways that you're cheating to get more? I don't know. But if God's revealed something, today is the day to confess that to Him, asking Him to forgive you, and ask Him to help you overcome it. Ask Him to help you be a generous giver. All right? Jesus uh, 
Jesus actually said those words, beware of guarding against every kind of greed. And uh, it's in the context of a parable. Somebody was asking Jesus, hey, fix this fam family problem we have about money. And Jesus is like, really? That's not my job. He said, be careful about greed. Guard against it. And then he tells a parable. The parable goes like this. A very rich man we talked about was a, a landowner. He owned land. And um, he had people working his land and producing vegetables, whatever. But his land was really fertile. And his land produced too much. He didn't produce just enough. He produced too much. His barns were full. He had nowhere to store all the extra that God had given him. Now, he was at a decision point. I have more than I need. I could, A, offer my workers. Here, take some extra. I'm going to raise your wages. You've worked so hard. We've produced so much. I'm going to share it with you. Take it home. Feed your families. Really, I have no room for it. We've had such a great year. I'm going to let you share in the profits. He could do that. He could take the extra to market and he could sell it and say, this, this money I'm going to give. I have all I need, so this is extra money. I'm going to do something good with it. I'm actually going to give and I'm going to help other people out. Okay, that's an option. Not the option he chose. He chose to install walk-in closets. He chose to put up a third car garage. He chose to put another freezer out in the garage. Didn't he? You know the parable. He says, I'll tear down my small, little, petty barns. And I'll put up more square footage. Right? I'll put up more room for my stuff. And I'll store so much stuff that I can retire early. I can kick back and relax. And it's just going to be awesome. Right? That's the path he chose, the selfish path. And this is the way God responded. He said, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Jesus always said, you can't love God and money because you're going to love one and hate the other, right? This can't mix. You've got to be really, really careful. If today you understand you've been a fool, that you have certainly damaged your relationship with God because of wealth, then thank him for it because he's given you a chance to redeem that. So today would be the day to seek forgiveness. If you aren't a Christian, again, all this hopefully makes sense to you. Um, you picked a good time to be here. As believers, man, we, we get beat up. The Bible beats us up because we're not perfect. I had another conversation about that today. It would have been nice if when you get saved, God threw a switch, right? Boom, and I make all good decisions the rest of my life. He doesn't do that, right? It's progressive. He does save us. He does forgive us of our sins. He does give us the promise of eternal life that cannot be taken away. But he leaves us here to work on us. And so a lot of Christians today, myself included, are reminded, you know, wait a minute, I can't love money. I need to use his resources in a way that's going to bring him the glory and expand the kingdom. So that, that, that's for us. You have to understand that you can have this relationship to start with. You have to understand he will change your life. He won't just forgive your sins and, and give you the hope of eternal life. He will enable you to have a rich and satisfying life. Again, you notice James doesn't talk about Jesus. He doesn't mention his name. He doesn't talk about the gospel. He's assuming everybody listening is already saved, and I can't assume that. So if you're here today and you're not a Christian and, and you'd like to talk a little bit more about it, Andrew's down here. I'll be down here. This will be your time to come, and we'd love to share that with you. For the rest of us as believers, we really need to let this soak in. We need to take this warning. Beware. Guard against every kind of greed, because if we're greedy, there's great troubles ahead. God, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for preserving your word for this day. and Thank you for every single individual who overcome all the distractions to be here and to listen. And God, now I thank you for the fact that you have given us a lot of resources. I thank you for the fact that now today you've shown us how to glorify you with them. Father, I pray for those. I know our room is not full of rich people. We do have those that maybe this hurts because they don't have resources. And I just pray that you'll touch their heart in a special way that someone will come alongside them and help them out as you encourage us to do through your word today. May we be generous givers. May we be doing good things with the resources that you provide above and beyond what we need. And we'll thank you for that. Those who don't know you, God, I pray that maybe this has intrigued them. Maybe the fact that uh, we can't have this kind of control and we can't see this kind of satisfying life will move them enough to come forward and ask that, hey, I, I want to know more about knowing Jesus. God, we'd love to speak with them and give them an encouragement that they need to be saved before they walk out of this place. God, I thank you for that and what you're about to do. Bless your invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.
Just stand and sing this with us. Andrew's going to stick around down front. Anything you want to talk about, whether it's with the message or not, I'll catch you at the door. If you've got an insert you want to give to me, I'd appreciate that. Uh, if you ever have questions about these kinds of things, stewardship and, and how to be a good steward of God's resources, that's what we're here for. We're actually training Mark wherever he went. Uh, Mark, Pastor uh, Tim used to be our, our financial guru. Mark's going to be our next one. He's getting his training. So, uh, again, we can help in any way we can. We'd love to. Uh, again, obviously, if there's a matter of Christianity and salvation, we'd love to talk to you as well. So it's been great to see you. Love you dearly. Thanks for being here. God loves you more. Coach, would you close us in prayer? Now, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message. We thank you for the information that you have given us. And Lord, may we be obedient unto you and take those things from us that we might share with other people. Oh, Lord, we need the desire in our life to give and love and care. Lord, bless us and help us now in everything we do, and we want to always give you the honor and the glory for our successes. In thy name we ask it. Amen. 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 Amen.